Welcome back, everybody. We are glad to have you back for another webinar organized by Princeton. And this time we have Bengt Holmstrom with us from MIT. Hi, Bengt. So Bengt will talk about the seasonality of COVID-19. And before I start, I would like to announce the results of the poll questions Bengt has proposed. The first question was, how much does your fear of COVID affect your daily life? And 30% that it affects them quite a lot, 60% it affects them moderately, and 10% said it doesn't affect them at all. Okay. The second question was, when do you believe the US will get the COVID crisis under control? And actually 20% think by the end of the spring 2021, actually 60% thought only by the end of 2021 and later than 2021, 20% said. Okay, and the last question was, will major universities return to the regular way of teaching after COVID or will it change? And the answer for the third question was split, roughly 50-50. So that gives us a background how to think about it. But let me now go back to a theme I've started earlier already in the series in the spring, where I said actually the COVID crisis can be divided in three sub -crises. First, a health crisis, second, an economic crisis, and thirdly, a financial crisis. So the health crisis is, of course, at the core, it triggers all of that. And to what extent health crisis spreads from person to person depends very much on behavioral responses. That's why we need um, SRR models with behavioral responses attached to it, because it affects a lot. And we have seen from the poll question, the fear and anxiety might actually drive things quite a bit, how people behave. The second crisis is an economic crisis, and we are now facing record unemployment. The GDP was dropping very fast. The speed of the crisis is just unprecedented. And we have a different form of recession. We have a so-called K recession, where some sectors are winning, like the tech sector, and other sectors are losing. So there's a huge redistribution going on. And thirdly, we had a financial crisis in March 2020 until the central banks, in particular the US Fed, stepped in very aggressively. And now we have stock market levels at record heights and the IPO issuances exceed the ones during the internet boom in the 1999. There's a new developments like the SPACs, the special purpose acquisition companies coming up and the bond issuance are also enormously large. So you'll see that the financial aspects seem always already almost disconnected from the real economy. But today we will focus more on the health aspects. So banks will focus very much on the health aspects. And initially there was a claim that there's a trade-off between health and wealth, between the health crisis and the economic crisis. But this turned out to be illusionary. Uh, essentially, whenever there's a health problem, you don't deal with the health problem, it also leads to some economic bad outcomes. So it goes actually hand in hand. So it might be temporarily that there's a trade-off then when you lock down the economy, the GDP tanks. And that's, you know, there's a trade-off better health, but less economic growth. But it doesn't, didn't turn out. First of all, when you lock down the economy through regulatory measures, that leads to decline in economic activity. But if you don't lock it down, people are afraid of doing things and going out to restaurants and other things. And that actually leads to a shutdown anyway. So the lockdown didn't make such a big difference. But more importantly, social distancing leads to lower GDP now, but it leads to better health conditions and hence to a larger GDP growth rate subsequently. So there is in the long run, there's more a congruence rather than a trade-off. That's why I think it's very important that we look at the health component as the initial trigger and try to understand how we can get the handle on that. And that's where Bengt and his team is actually focusing on. And I applaud that, that he's doing that. So the health crisis is essentially the driver of the whole phenomenon. And they have aerosols, there's UV light, and uh, Bengt will go in all of these aspects, but he will focus primarily on the seasonal patterns of uh, the COVID crisis the, from the health perspective. And once we answer these questions, what is really driving it? Can you realize is the COVID virus very vulnerable or more generally any 
coronavirus, not only the COVID-19 coronavirus, very vulnerable to UV light, it might lead to totally different policy measures. What should we do in terms of policy? Should we then actually focus on days when the sun is out, we should go out and uh, be much more active outside without being worried meeting others or not? Or is it more long run uh, perspective where we have to say, okay, if there was a lot of sunshine in the summer, then we have to be less, can be less stringent in the winter, we have to enforce a stricter lockdown. And the second thing is, should we equip our, our air conditioning units with some UV lights, as many people have proposed. And we know from very early on that UV light can actually kill off viruses and bacteria. There was essentially some Nobel Prize already in 1903 by Niels Finsen, who got the Nobel Prize in 1903 for showing that UV lights is actually changing things a lot. So with this, I leave the floor to Bengt, who has studied, he was part of a commission in Finland comprising of economists and non-economists, how to manage the corona crisis or the COVID crisis. And he was very active in, uh, in this commission and the commission was very involved how to manage the crisis in Finland. And he told me earlier that he, he was planning to retire, he retired from MIT, but then worked much, much harder subsequently in his retirement and he had to work at MIT as a professor to manage all the things uh, to work in this commission with the others to figure out what to do. And part of his insights will be presented here today and we're very grateful for him to do this for us and grateful to his co-authors as well, who will be with us for the Q&A later on. So I will save some of the important questions you're asking to the end uh, in order uh, to get their feedback as well. Thanks again, Ben, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for for the inviting me and uh, and for the introduction. I'm here with my co-authors. There is no paper yet, but uh, but uh, we are working on it. Um, Marty Hetemaki, who is uh, <coughs> who is from the Helsinki Graduate School of Economics, and Johanna Hukinen from Bank of Finland. Marty uh, has been a very influential person in Finland. I voted several times as the most influential non-politician because he was a uh, permanent uh, secretary of the finance ministry for eight years and very successfully so. So he commissioned the, the, the committee where I was, uh, well, well, how, and that's how I got in, involved with the, with the COVID research. So, uh, let me just uh, make a disclaimer in addition to what <laughs> what uh, uh, what Marcus said. He's, he called me an econometrician, which I most definitely am not. Marte and Johanna has essentially done all the empirical work and 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 a lot of lot of the all the econometric work and a lot of it. Uh, this uh, talk, the reason I'm speaking is that this will be mainly about uh, showing features of the paper. I'm not focusing on the econometrics almost at all. So I will, I will tell a narrative uh, and put forward uh, 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 here two hypotheses that uh, the broader one is that COVID-19 is seasonal and, and uh, in in more detail, it's a, there's a sort of strong wave in the fall. We haven't seen it yet, the full account, but we see the, the, the storm gathering. And, uh, and uh, that's a prediction from this, uh, this um, interpretation of the events that we, I will show you. And, uh, and uh, the good news is that uh, there is likely to be a rather weak or eventually no, no wave at all in the spring. This is not a statement as a function of vaccines. This is a statement which comes from the, just from the seasonality. And uh, to support that, I'm going to provide historical, both historical and current evidence. So that's, that's the first hypothesis. Uh, and then more specifically as a sub hypothesis of this is, is that, uh, that uh, UV radiation is actually a driver of this uh, seasonality. 
and uh, I'm going to use some physical, well, there's both physical and empirical evidence to support that. And, uh, and we'll see, we are still in the middle of researching how strong the evidence for UV is, but we think it is quite strong. So uh, I should qualify this as preliminary, the hypothesis, but, uh, but I'm going to sound like I know that <laughs> Just, just to store your interest and, 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 uh, and your reaction, I'm going to sound uh, relatively confident in, in some respect. So keep that in mind. Uh, so with no, nothing more to say, let me go to the outline. So, so I, I'm going to do the historical current patterns, the case for UV, then I go and look at other variables than UV. So I start with just UV alone. And, and then go to mobility and stringency, which are two other factors that affect, uh, affect the COVID infections. And, uh, and I won't show much of the regression results, but I will show you the, the basically the long run elasticities of the models or, or, or of the UV rather, and then close with qualifications and a conclusion. So that's the outline. So that, let's start with the historical data. Uh, here is a striking picture that comes from, from uh, Sweden. Uh, and the reason it's striking is that there's relatively little data on even coronaviruses and, and uh, the, what we call positivity, positivity rates. And, and, uh, and so that means the fraction of people infected relative to those tested. And you see that in the A picture, you see the fraction of, of positive tests. As I said, that's so called the positivity rate. And, uh, and that, is, uh, this, that is low relative to COVID. So COVID has had a much higher rate that you'll see later in the paper. So these are not as, as dangerous viruses, obviously but uh, they show a strikingly strong pattern of uh, seasonality. And you see it in the left picture uh, quite clearly. Uh, the red, there, it, the, the, there are four viruses of which two are bunched together in the green. They are co they are coronaviruses and the red is the average uh, of those four. On the right picture, you see more clearly that, uh, or very much more clearly, that the virus, uh, uh, the, the bottoms out in the summer and peaks just about the turn of the year. So the turn of the year are on, in the far left and far right, and, and the summer months are in the six to 10. And this is, this is averaging, averaging uh, again, uh, the red line is averaging of, across the viruses. So seasonality, the point here is this is at least a reason to start thinking about, is it season, is this, coronavirus also seasonal. Se seasonal. Here's another picture, sort of as a preliminary support of why are we even thinking about seasonality? And that comes from the Spanish flu. It didn't fit into this, this picture, the heading, but it's the Spanish flu, which I'm sure everybody has heard of. And it's 14 countries and the mortality rate. It's important that here it's mortality rate. The mortality rates are excess, I'm sorry, excess mortality, mortality rates. So they are uh, thought always to be rather reliable measures of the virulence of the, of the, of the, this uh, disease. And what's most striking in this picture, obviously, is that when you look at the main wave, which is uh, occurred uh, in, in October, November, in that region of, uh, of, uh, 19, 1918, that wave uh, is highly synchronized. I, I, we have not centered the picture around the red line, you know, so that the peak hits, but you see the peaks hits exactly in these 14 countries. It doesn't include any other than European countries, but, but still that, that is a, it's a, a, a quite a remarkable uh, uh, scene. It is also the case that you see other waves. So for instance, uh, US, which isn't in this picture, had three or even four waves, something. 
uh, you see other smaller waves. They saw, there's France, for instance, they saw a wave early in the, already in the 1970s, possibly. These are excess death rates, so we are not entirely sure about it. But, but they were small beginning wave, the middle wave big, and the, the later wave. Uh, that you can see, for instance, the, the left hand column, you see that they saw, they saw again around, around, that's more like around January, January, February. The, the, the small uh, sort of humps that you see line up quite well also. So again, very, very similar patterns. And, uh, and uh, I should add, uh, Spanish flu was very deadly. So there's 500 million were infected and, and 50 to 100 million estimated deaths. So uh, that's probably one reason why it died off quickly. In, in some paradoxical sense, a virus that's very deadly is actually, it goes over quickly also because it doesn't spread. So in that respect, this, uh, this COVID virus that we see now is, is, uh, is relatively mild and in that sense, perhaps more dangerous. So here you see the COVID, uh, COVID uh, selection of countries. Uh, it's, we just chose, we have more countries, but uh, we chose some. Uh, first thing to say, these are not at scale. So Germany, for instance, the hump in Germany is the same as the same height as the hump in, in France. And, and we are counting here COVID, again, we are counting COVID cases, 14-day uh, sum uh, per 100,000 persons. So that's, that's, the, that's our main uh, dependent variable and uh, that we try to explain. But what I want to emphasize here is that you see that there's a very suggestive pattern here too, that it's very flat in the, in the summertime. Uh, the one big outlier is United States, which is in the corner, in the right down, low, lower corner. It, it is a, a difficult case, but let me add that we haven't even seen a full cycle yet. And we haven't even seen, unfortunately, we haven't even seen the biggest peak yet. It's going to come now in the winter is our view if it follows at all the patterns that I described earlier. And, it, and, 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 and the first waves tend to be, have more erratic behavior because the virus in different countries or different places hasn't sort of found its rhythm yet. So here are two peaks, uh, but uh, the first peak ha has dissimilarities across the, across the, the different countries. So, uh, but there is, a, there is a, there is, uh, uh, I won't speak. I, I won't speak about the United States, unfortunately. Further, this Canada next to the United States, you see that Canada behaves much more like the Europe, Europe, and and the U.S. maximum there is 300 cases, so it's high. Whereas Canada, for instance, is just I think it's 19. You you won't be able to see it, and I don't see it very well either. But that's. Uh, uh, that's, it's the flat bottom that's important and then the right tail is the, it, it are the important ones. So let me emphasize that in a picture there you see a little clearer. Here is Finland for obvious reasons. It's important because we are all from Finland, uh, Germany, France, Spain, Italy. So it's just, a, it's not quite a random sample, but again, the point is here you really see how flat the bottom is. And it's in the summertime, this goes away, just, uh, just like the, the coronaviruses that I in the beginning showed. The, the, first, uh, the first hump is actually lines up well for these countries in, in, and, and it may have to do with, you know, the fact that uh, the glo glo we, are, we are very global, we travel and so this spreads fast around the globe, unlike saying during the Spanish flu. And therefore, uh, therefore it's, uh, it's, uh, it looks that way. It's very important to understand it was killed off. Now the question is why was it killed off? There was a lot of, uh, there was some measures taken by, by policy measures, strong policy measures. Uh, one of the things it shows though, is that even though during that time, the left, I'm looking now at the left hump, you know, during that time, testing started to increase. So, so the more you test, the more, uh, more cases you of course are going to observe so we will look at that positivity rate later to control for that. But uh, the point is here, even though tests went up, 
the virus actually was killed off. So, so uh, that says that in the spring there was a, was a, a rather strong uh, headwind somehow for the virus. And Bibi argued that if the headwind really comes from the UV radiation, but significant, significantly because the sun, it becomes brighter and brighter, the sun. Whereas uh, uh, if we go to the right side there into the right tail, uh, the reverse is true. We have tail, the, the virus now has tailwinds because it gets darker and darker, less and less radiation. And that's why we unfortunately forecast a very serious, uh, a very serious outbreak still. We haven't seen, uh, seen the end yet. Now, France is an outlier right now, but you can see that all of these curves, uh, they actually all start coming. And, and, uh, and you must have read in the press that people are really nervous. Uh, the hope is that the spring, the, 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 the sort of good news is that the spring may be much, much weaker than, than what people seem to forecast in the poor. So, and, and uh, I think the summer will be okay. So uh, let me go and, and now make the case for UV. Those were just seasonal. Because I already uh, mentioned UV, but you see here, for instance, France, which is a, is a country where there has been a lot of uh, virus. Then you see that uh, just the negative, you know, when the UV goes up, the COVID cases go down. So this is just what I said. And here you can see again that on the left end, uh, the virus has headwinds. And so, so, uh, so it, it gets worse. Whereas on the right side, on the right end, uh, right tail, it has uh, tailwinds as it goes up. Now, an obvious question here uh, comes up is, is you know, this, these are all northern hemisphere countries, and France is certainly above the equator. So, if this UV is is a course, one of the things you ought to see at least is that if you go to the southern hemisphere you will see just 180 days uh, translation in this because uh, there in the southern hemisphere, you have, of course, the sun is at its peak in the, in, in, in the winter time. That is just around the, the turn of the year. And so let's go and look at this. So here is uh, Thank South you. Africa. There's one question about UV light. Can you say something about the different types of UV light or will you come to Yes. This? Okay, so I should say very important, UV light. Johanna is the world expert on measuring UV light. Actually, the measurement instrument was uh, invented. It's in cooperation, I think, with France or something. But Finland was instrumentally inventing these today's UV measurement lights. And, and Johanna is, is the world expert. If you want to just ask any part of the world, and he will tell you with five minute intervals what the UV light is right then. So, uh, so uh, the answer is that it measures, Johanna will be able to answer here, but there are three types of UV lights. And I think this measures probably all three separately, but I'm not sure Johanna has to, I don't know if he wants to comment right now. It, it doesn't, they will get back to this if, if the, but, but the, the UVC, as I recall, is the strongest one. And that's, uh, the, that's the important one for killing the virus. But all of them kill virus, so they 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 are all there. So here is the striking picture. In in, in my view, they, this was actually out of sample. That is, we we had this hypothesis before uh, focusing on the bottom of the part and you know the patterns that I showed you earlier. Then it occurred to us that you know we really should look at 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 we should see the reverse in in the in the southern hemisphere. And here you see the cases. These are at scale, same scale. So you see the, the new COVID cases in South Africa versus France. And, uh, and uh, it sort of speaks for itself. It, it's, uh, it's not, the beginning is again, the left, the left end now, now we are talking about countries that are far apart. So we shouldn't focus too much about, about the left end because we know that Africa got the virus much later than, than but, and in general, yeah, it got later. So, but the point is that this, this, this South Africa had its peak in the midsummer, and we had uh, we we are likely to have our peak, and it looks like it from the earlier day that you know that it was in 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 midwinter, and uh, here you see again the UV load 
which we think explains the different patterns. South Africa, you will, you will all peaks, peaks in, in, in the December, January, and in France, it peaks in mid-July. So this just validates this, uh, this sort of, it fits in with that picture. And uh, in case you think South Africa is the only country, you know, Australia has the same pattern, but here you see that Australia is following the Northern Hemisphere pattern from the beginning, probably because that's where the infection started. So again, the beginning is always not, one can't focus on the beginning. And, and, uh, and so, and Australia has had, of course, very strict, strict uh, clampdowns and uh, New Zealand even more so, but it's still there. So let me go and talk about the stringency, the mobility and stringency measures uh, a little more and, and, uh, and uh, the, let me just look at my, my notes. So uh, these are the two mobility. So mobility here is going to be measured by the Google and sometimes by the Apple data. That is the mobility data. Now, one of the problems with that data is there, is, there isn't a data for a year ago. So the data is only there for for this year, and and you see why that is important, you know, a shortcoming. So, three, uh, yeah. There's a question by David Amis. He would like to know if whether you also looked at humidity and temperature as an alternative explanation of the seasonality. Again, Johanna would be able to answer, but but temperature, uh, temperature, I don't think has much of an effect. I should have known that. I mean, we talked about it because, but but it's just I lost from uh, I I can't recall it now. And and humidity. Let me say a word about you know we know a lot about UV light having an effect on the virus. That is, there are a lot of tests showing uh, showing that uh, if the UV light uh, is used, you know you can disinfect, for instance, a room or you can disinfect. Uh, you know, the Chinese actually are disinfecting buses. Nowadays, they don't wipe things off. They, in the, in the nighttime, they just put on the UV lights for say five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes and it's all gone. So the virus is extremely vulnerable uh, to UV light and, and it, it, UV light, it, you know, inactivates it. The humidity is another factor that is, has a significant effect on the virus, how long it lives. So it, it actually lives less time in humidity than it, than it is in, 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 the, in dry conditions. And I think the temperature is in my guess that it, 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 it sort of prevails more in, in cold weather than, than in warm weather. That's 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 that exhausts my my knowledge to to the question. Okay. But let me let me let me go on. We can come back to this in the discussion. They are factors that they matter. Uh, so here are the four countries that we focus on in our sort of empirical work, uh, which is uh, which is this mobility and stringency, and then how they even the regressions and. And uh, and uh, not all at the same time, but uh, you see uh, the one thing I just want I just want to show that they are rather different, and especially Sweden is different. And Sweden we are going to use as a sort of natural experiment because they follow the entirely different policy. Uh, I I bet you have read in the in the Financial Times and others there's there's a big debate about whether fit Sweden. Is, is on the right course or not, and, and it looks like they are now going to start to reverse course and come back into the pack, but uh, they have been very in, very independent, which is, which is unfortunate because there has been a lot of death, but it's fortunate because it gives us some, some, some control. And it, it's, uh, so we are going to use this as a Sweden as a controlled experiment of, of sort in, in one of, so let me go and, and, and just, the pictures tend to speak a lot about the story, and 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 so you see that 
Here is mobility. What, what, what I already said, it's Google data and it's measured. Do you see the zero there on the left side? You see the, the mobility measure. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's change or decline relative to the January 1st or you know, around January 1st. I don't think they have just one day, but they look, they look at the, in the beginning of the year. So it's relative to the beginning of the year. And so if, for instance, France essentially locked itself down, you know, around, uh, uh, around April 4th, very dramatic moves. You see the yellow is, is uh, Germany. So it was, it was already also pretty aggressive. And, uh, and, uh, and then Finland is, is in between there and then Sweden goes its own way, as, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it was, uh, it didn't encourage people that strongly to 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 stay home, for instance. And and it certainly certainly they, you you have seen pictures how how people are walking around on the streets without masks. But they are coming together. The mobility comes together. So one of the things you can look from here, this picture is that even though mobility stayed high, stayed stable, I should say, then then actually the case, you know, the France and and the other countries started to started to shoot up. And so uh, you see from this picture already that mobility is not likely to explain that much of the, of, of the case, with the exception perhaps for, for Sweden. Uh, and that may be a myth, you know, something that this picture is misreading, but, but it is indicative that the mobility isn't as such uh, as strong perhaps. So if we go now to the policy stringency side, uh, again, we are on the left left side. We have have the this is the Oxford measure, and it's it's kind of hard to interpret. But the higher levels, I think it runs from zero to hundred, and higher levels means more stringent. So France, in in accordance with the previous picture of mobility, France actually was very stringent. They are, the other countries are not here. I'll come to them just in a moment. The, the thing to notice here is that uh, that uh, the la the policy measures lag. So you know it's it's reactive to the virus rather than it's leading the virus. And this is a point we are going to come back to, but I I, I want to emphasize it already now. If it's seasonal, and we can show that it's seasonal, I understand that it's seasonal. That's going to have big impact on policy. So it's it's a, it's economically very important as well. So we could take preventive measures. We are, in some sense, we are late with the, with the, with the, with the fall wave that is looming, and uh, and and so uh, so uh, you could see it also from the mobility fact that people haven't yet changed at all, though very little their behavior in in terms of mobility, and and that's very worrisome potentially. And so uh, this this stringency. If we go to the next slide, we see these four countries that I was talking about. And, uh, and you see France as the most extreme, you see Sweden as the least extreme, all did something. Now, I don't, you know, the Oxford index is hard to interpret, they, 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 all sorts of things go into it. But Sweden, Sweden had own, has only had suggestions. They haven't shut down restaurants, they haven't, uh, you know, prevented people from going on buses, they haven't restricted the number of people in stores, all sorts of measures that, for instance, Finland took. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm sure France and these others. So Sweden has gone its own way, but I think it doesn't quite show as much here. Uh, there's some, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, it shows that, uh, that that the three, uh, the three first countries are, or, or higher countries are, are sort of somewhat similar to Central European and Finland. The, let me go to uh, the regressions or the, the econometric. Perhaps you can do it. Right? Yeah, you can do it. Uh, so there are a number of questions, but I would like to know more about tropical countries. You know, they have a lot of UV and have a long days. And if you look at India, for example, there are a, a huge number of cases in India, also in Latin America. Uh, how yes. do you pick your countries? And uh, 
you know, can you say a little bit about uh, these other countries, why they're not in your data sample and how do you interpret that? Well, we, I, I guess the short answer is that, that we have actually many more countries that I'm indicating. These are not, yeah, these are just representative countries. You know, we have, we have a lot more countries uh, that we have run regressions on, or at least many more countries, let's put it that way. But, uh, but uh, let me say this on, Mar Marty has a favorite picture, which shows you, <laughs> shows you how latitude affects coronaviruses historically. And, and, and uh, the, the, the short answer is that in the, in the furthest out of the pole, things are really center, centered around, in the northern side, centered around around the, the, you know, the peak is at the, around the change of the year. And, and uh, when you go in the Southern hemisphere, it's the reverse. And the closer you go to the equator, the milder you are the diseases and the viruses and, and, and you sort of see no seasonal pattern at all for understandable reasons, of course. But it, it is, so the answer is that, that uh, India and these countries are pretty close actually to the equator. And, and so there is, in principle, there isn't, there shouldn't be as serious cases. India, of course, has massive amounts of people. So it, the numbers look bad, but I think if one looks at, I haven't studied India, we haven't studied India in detail, but I, I think they are not as badly off as the numbers may suggest. Part of it is also, of course, that they may be testing very little, so it's hard to draw any conclusions from the data. Mm. As yet, you know, the, the heart is, if, just, if you only test the people with symptoms, then you are missing all the ones that, uh, that are, are, you know, has so mild that they don't show symptoms or they don't want to come and show up. So uh, I don't, we don't have, but it's a good, absolutely. By the way, this whole talk is intended to stimulate more research. I hope if, if we achieve that, I'm very happy. You know, this is a preliminary investigation and, and it's meant to inspire more research and, and, and we may still be proved, you know, wrong or, you know, it be reinforced or something. So I, it's all, whoever wants to do the Southern part, <laughs> very welcome. So here is the, here is the kind of structure of the, of the econometric part. We are measuring the, our dependent variable is the 14-day sum of new COVID cases per 100,000. That's what you have seen all the time in the pictures. And this is European data. And on the right side, you know, the right side variables are, there's a, there's a time trend, an exponential time trend. And, and uh, we use exponential because you might think that, you know, if you look at the the standard epidemiological models, that sounds crazy, but actually the levels of infection are, the, the infection rates, I'm sorry, the immunity rates are very low still. And, and so that warrants up, we think, and, 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 and you can also see it how France, for instance, the increases that you see now suggest that there's a, mm -hmm. there's a uh, I'm sorry, this is a time trend, so, but, but it, it's not as much affected because of the, there's not immunity yet. The UV, uh, the UV variables, we have three UV variables. There's a short term, uh, there's a level, there's, a, there's a, a change variable going back three to five weeks. And then there's, a, there's sort of a year, almost a, on a year level, you know, changes across years uh, or, or comparing this year to, the, to, to the, the past 15 years. And it turns out also to be effective. And then, then we have the policy control measure is the Oxford index and the mobility is, is either Google or Apple data. And so that's, that's the structure. What we are going to do is we are going to separately test. We are going to keep, keep the time trend. We are going to keep the, on the whole the, the UVs there, but then we will test separately the, the, the policy and the mobility. Now it's very important, of course, to understand that there's uh, there's all sorts of problems here because po policy and mobility measures are, are, are there's collinearity, there's endogeneity, as we saw from the 
We saw from the strictness measure, we saw that, you know, policymakers react to the virus and the virus react to what policymakers do. So we, we have a lot of problems, uh, I'll come to back, which we haven't solved. Let's put it shortly that way. But still, uh, still we have four treatments here. I, I don't want to get into this table. So I don't want to look at numbers. I just want to say that, that this is a fairly sparse set of variables and they are independently tested. The, the policy measure one and two, one is the baseline without the long-term UV. Then we go to two with the long-term UV improves quite a bit. The objective there was to get the autocorrelation uh, you know, down, that is the, no the noise level up, the white noise up, and, and it more than doubles, as you can see from the test scores, from 0.15 to 0.37. So, so that has been one, the objective in terms of calibrating this model and choosing these lags and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of testing out to see that the, the autocorrelation goes down. And then, then we see that, uh, th then we see this, uh, we keep this uh, third measure for that reason. And, and uh, the T statistics on the whole are pretty good. And, and uh, the one thing to say is that, uh, that the, the, the stringency measure does have a, a significant effect on, the, on this regression. That is, uh, that, uh, that is, it seems to be important. And uh, let me therefore next go to the last line, but in a separate slide, that is, uh, let me go and look at the long run elasticity of, of from that table and from some other runs we have done. So here's the model one, two, and three. Uh, and you see that France was the country that we were using. I may have omitted to say that it was France that was that country we used. You see that the long, there's so a 1% increase Permanent increase in UV uh, reduces the 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 COVID new COVID cases by 3.43 percent. So that's a pretty strong effect. I think rather than focusing perhaps on the strong effect, it's it's significant that that it's very stable across the models. So we we go and do the policy, we add it separately. It's, it it is almost the same. We add mobility separately. It's also almost the same. So then can you say a little bit, how much does UV vary over time in, in no, I have no, you know, can you give us some, is the, the standard deviation, is it 10% or is it, how, how does it vary? You Again, know? Johanna would be, a, the, the short answer is that it, it, it's, I, I, I'm sorry that I did not, uh, you see, I'm not an empiricist. So uh, I should have looked at that, but you can see from the T statistics that, that, you know, there's a reasonable, reasonable, you know, uh, variation and ratio so so that uh, I think the my my guess I let me give one figure if you go one one thousand meters up mm -hmm. in altitude uh, ten percent increase in 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 the UV so so yeah. so yeah. what what is varying a lot I come back to the altitude which is interesting the UV what happens, for instance, in Finland, the reason we think the long-term UV ratio was, mattered was that, that there was a big ozone hole above sort of north, no, the Nordic countries, you know, the Scandinavia and Finland, northern Scandinavia and Finland, and that could have had a big effect. So actually the UV varies much more than I thought, but you saw that in the pictures also, that they vary sort of a fair amount. So you, see, you, see a few, you, 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 you will see, I think, you will see okay. some comparisons also with, with I think, Sweden and Finland. I, I may it have varies started. across location, but it also varies across time quite a bit. You know, well, it's... across time it varies, of course, that's the whole seasonality that yeah. it's, it's very, uh, very... I mean, high frequency day to day? Yes, it is. The, well, that is your on a day to day, I don't know, but it, it varies within, you know, say week to week. At least it, but I, I suspect it varies day to day because there's clouds, there's rain, you know, there's all sorts of things that affect the UV that comes down to earth. So there is, there is quite a bit of variability. Anyway, I wanted to emphasize the other thing here to emphasize is that, that it's France is stable across the models, the, the long term elasticity is stable, but it's also 
uh, relatively stable or similar across the countries. So you see that uh, there is some variation in model one. It seems to be a little more, a little more perhaps of model two and even a little more in model three. But that's its sort of stability both within country across models and within across countries for any of these models. So, uh, you know, that's a good sign. Let's put it that way, that, uh, that uh, there could be all sorts of reasons that uh, it's sort of reassuring, let's put it that way. And uh, so the bottom line for just from the regression is that the UV effect is quite strong. Mm -hmm. You know, the UV effect relative, if we go, I, I didn't go through that, through that uh, regression, but the effect from stringency was more significant, but you know, in some sense, the mobility effect seems surprisingly long, uh, uh, small. So this is why we decided to do study Sweden and Finland separately because they had a big difference in, they are very, they are next door neighbor, they are on the same latitude. So they are sort of certain natural controls and, uh, and they have, uh, they have mobility, you know, sig significant, uh, yeah, okay. So that, that's, so we, we are, here you see just the mobility data again for Finland and Sweden uh, as comparison. So Sweden, <laughs> Sweden, Sweden by, by, by Joshua yeah. Lili, if I may ask. Did you also look within countries and a subnational heterogeneity, especially if you have long countries or tall countries like Chile, where there might be no, a lot of it's a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. It's a great question because we, Chile also has big differences in altitude. Yes. But we have not. Okay. We, we have been locked, locked down, you know, here. <laughs> so we haven't moved around the globe too much. Uh, but no, but it's it seriously. France, it, do you have data within France too? Southern France, much more sunny than northern yeah, France? Yeah, the, the UV data is all over from it's 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 aggregated, I think, from from the all all these different. Mm -hmm. They have lots of measurement places, and and it varies across uh, within country. Right. Uh, you know the UV, uh, even even be, uh, probably even within the day. But again, I'm 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 really speaking. Uh, you know about something Johanna knows infinitely more. Perhaps you can at the end of Q and A we can come back. Yeah, to that. yeah, we'll see if he said, wants to say something about it. The, the, so here is the so-called natural experiment. We are looking at you know here a shock has hit, so we are looking at Sweden. Sweden, something happens to Sweden, something happens to Finland. So we are looking at the mobility effect of the shock. And, and we compare how much Sweden's mobility change relative to Finland's mobility change by differencing it. So this is like a diff and diff type thing. And then we look similarly about the new cases in Sweden but less the new cases in Finland. So, so the red line is, is uh, the you know, mobility changes and you saw that it, it ma matches of course the previous picture that we saw. So it's just taking the differences of those lines and then we see the, the case differences here, here in Sweden. So you see that, one thing you see is that there's a big lag here. You know, the, 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 to the extent mobility sort of explains something, it, it comes with a surprising lag and actually in the regression analysis, the lag is, uh, is, uh, is uh, significant, around 70 days. Yeah, so mobility, changes, whatever drives the mobility changes, it, ha it has this lag effect on, on cases. Uh, which is of course worrisome because, because it, it means it's, it could be hard to catch, one has to be very aggressive catching the virus. And uh, so this is the Apple mobility. So from this, you can tell, if, is it one or the other that goes up, but, but you know, that the previous picture showed that. And, and so here is the regression. I just put down the, the specification and then the coefficients here up in the uh, above this all you see there's a difference in, in log cases between Sweden and Finland. There's a constant term. There's a, there's a difference in, in one, one, p, one day lagged cases. That's just, a, that's just a, what one 
that's one way of doing this. So that's not an important thing. But the, the key is that, of course, the coefficients in front of the mobility and in front of the UV. And you see that mobility actually comes in with significant, it's quite significant, the mobility here between Sweden, this is just between Sweden and Finland. And, and, uh, and so uh, there is, one can measure, one can sort of measure the elasticity by just dividing, uh, dividing the, the, let me just see, the, the, Point, the point 0.277 that you see there with the point 0.028 gives you the long run elasticity and it's of the order of, of about 10. So whatever the mobility index means, you know, this is this percentage change that, uh, you know, uh, then, then uh, when that changes by 1%, uh, the, the cases go up in this estimation by, by in the long run. A permanent change brings it up by 10%. So it sounds quite high and, and all these regressions have this endogeneity and other problems. So one has to sort of take it with some, some, some caution. But in any case, let me then- You use weekly data from the labels of the x-axis, is this correct? What's weekly? Where so you have this time series across Sweden and across uh, Finland. And every week there's one data point, is this? No, no, it's a rolling 14 day. Oh, so it's 14 da days, it's okay. daily data, but it's, it's 14 days accumulated. All, all everything you so see, it's a daily, see, see it's is a four, 14 days, the sum of 14 days, not the average, just the sum okay. of changes in cases and, and, and then it's, uh, it's daily data. Okay. So here are some co co pol qualifications. What, uh, UV may correlate, so to speak. Well, it's an exogenous variable, so it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it has that favorable feature. That is, there's no, you know, nothing going from 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 viruses to to UV radiation. But uh, but it can come through other factors like behavioral patterns. People go out in the summer more, less in the winter, and and uh, and so on. You know, in Lapland, people are are, are inside, you know, six months. And, uh, and a little exaggerated, but you know, and so on. So there, there is, uh, there is. We have not studied that aspect, and of course, there is endogeneity and collinearity problems with, with the with the UV and and uh, with the UV and the. I'm sorry, the mobility and mobility and uh, and the stringency measures strongly, and a possible instrument and and. Is it an interest? I just want to mention the altitude is something that is sort of it has this thing that it moves the UV. Uh, you know, I just told you thousand meters, ten percent more UV on on average, and so this is exogenous sort of this drives variation in UV by altitude, and that's a very interesting thing. And there has been done studies that show that at higher altitude, if you take the, uh, the these are epidemiologists, if at higher altitude, if, if you have less virulent virus and you have uh, less cases, this is per population density. So it's controlling for population density by dividing this number. Uh, or, or, and, and, and so that's very suggestive, but but we did a quick look at the Mexico, for instance, which is a natural. Peru could be another Mexico, but it didn't look to me uh, that uh, that that actually holds up, for instance, in Mexico. But we, we really need to look into this. And then, of course, there's a question: Is it a good instrument or not really? But uh, let me emphasize another thing, which is we haven't seen a full cycle yet. So this uh, U.S., for instance, may still fall in line the way things fell in line with the with the other viruses, the other coronaviruses. Uh, one thing that that one has to be nervous about is that testing has increased a lot. So you know that obviously will drive the test count up. You know that's one of the few things. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, that uh, President Trump is right about. 
Uh, that, but it doesn't mean that uh, it does actually mean the other way for the, for the positivity. So positivity comes down. So let me just show you. Here is, the, here is France again, which is our leading case. You see the number of tests. You see the, the, the blue line is just the one that you have seen all the time. The yellow li line is, uh, is the number of tests. But notice that the tests sort of, first of all, this increase here in the middle of the summer doesn't much matter because the virus is dead. And so the test increase here, it has an effect and then it kind of stabilizes. It's not clear to us why it goes down, but it sort of stabilizes. So we think that this test problem is actually at the tail, the, the beginning of the virus. And by the time we get into the hundreds of thousands of tests, you know, in France, for instance, uh, it's much less of a problem. But if you want to look at the uh, positivity rate, which means what fraction of the testing have actually COVID, then you see that it's very high in the beginning for, because there are so few tests and then eventually it levels off, off something. One thing that's clear from here is we are seeing a new wave. It's not just caused by you know, a change in the number of tests. And the other countries are actually more, you see the same pattern in other countries. So, so we, we think this testing anomaly uh, is going to obviously resolve itself when we move forward. So let me talk, conclude the main takeaways. I'm running a little bit over time. Asymmetric waves. That's, that's, in my view, or our view, the key message is that, that, that the virus has, if this seasonality is caused, it is strong, and if it's caused by UV especially, the virus has tailwinds in the fall. That is why it's much more, the, the fall wave or the winter wave, you know, is much bigger than the, the spring wave. In fact, the spring wave in the case of Spanish flu, for instance, more or less disappeared. And so, uh, the next months will be really indicative of whether this is true. So this is an auto sample prediction. Unfortunately, it's a bad prediction, which is that it's going to be big trouble. The good news is that the virus has headwinds in the spring, meaning it goes against the sunlight. The sunlight increases and, 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 and that's why you see this asymmetry in these waves. It, it, it disappeared pretty quickly, the spring wave. And, and, and we will get a, a, a nice summer, hopefully. Uh, all this is important because we think if this bears itself out, proactive policy is really important. And it's also important for correcting the models that uh, they, we have not seen models where, where this seasonality is sort of built in the way an economist would. So uh, with that, I will, uh, I will say just thanks and then questions. So. I just wanted to, perhaps your quarters can come in too. There's one big question which Mark Grimblatt from UCLA raised. What's about vitamin D? So isn't the UV producing, light producing vitamin D? And is it like, if you do a policy measure, should we increase the UV light exposure of people? Or should we actually just give them more vitamin D and this will solve the issue too? I don't know, do you have a take on vitamin D issue? I think that's, it's a very, very important question in terms of policy implications. Well, I can answer it from personal experience because I'm a hypochondriac. So I, I know about vitamin D quite a bit. So, so vitamin D, UV light is by far the best way of getting vitamin D. The body doesn't process all the pills we take over the counter. In combination, so so if you go, for, you know, you take up your sleeves and go for for keep, go for an hour in the summertime, you have easily gotten your dose of vitamin D already. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the UV is much more effective, and on the whole, it has I think, but uh, but in, of course, you know, in the in the winter time, uh, these supplements are important. Now this speaks to this problem I said: is it UV like directly, like killing the virus, as I indicated? Or is it that UV actually stimulates vitamin D growth and therefore we become more immune? It's well known that vitamin D enhances immunity. That's, mm -hmm. that's known for, you know, the doctors yes. from hundreds of years, hundred years at least, or, or something like that. I, I don't know when vitamin D was discovered, say, say cautiously 50 years, but, but it's, it's so, so that's the answer. Okay. 
you see that this is the question does UV affect things B as some other yes. element? So this concerning that, you know, if you don't have a clear theory, how would you structure as a policy maker the communication to the public? Because if you communicate a clear channel through which it works or a clear theory, then it's much more convincing uh, than saying, okay, I found some UV light has some implications. Do you agree with that? Or how would you communicate? What's the best communication strategy? And then comes the question by David Blau. He said, he's very surprised that there's little talk in the media or even among economists about UV light. Why is that, uh, that nobody has focused on it so far? Well, one of the things I learned from being on this commi committee uh, and, and started looking into the epidemiologists is that they are just like economists. They are very wedded to their models. So this SIR model that they use, which is a really a forecasting model, they are, they, that's what they use. You know, they are into forecasting. So that's why economists actually have a big important role to play because there are relatively much fewer studies. So to try to understand, you know, what, what are the sources of these things and so on. So, so that's my take on it. I may be too critical, but I'm saying that we economists are, of course, incredibly wedded to our models too. And so sometimes, uh, uh, so the financial crisis actually showed that outsiders sometimes knew more than we economists because they came up with a fresh eye. So that's just a hypothesis, but, but Mark Lipsitz, for instance, from Harvard University, who's a very distinguished uh, epidemiologist, he's pushing UV. Mm -hmm. He thinks it's important, and, and I think it was part of our thing. That's why we went on board. If there had been nobody, you know, maybe we would have been more cautious. So it's not like they, and, and I told you about the elevation data and so on. So there is, there is, a, there is some UV studies that come from, or actually quite a few numbers of UV studies. I should say that this big southern, northern southern hemisphere data, it comes from taking hundreds of of studies of, of light, uh, you know, you, you, or seasonality or something like that. I don't know if they studied UV, but there's seasonality and show that, that it, it, in the equator, there's no seasonality in the, in the poles, so to speak. It, it, is, it is very strong. So, so they, it's not like we are in a vacuum here. So, so let me just give you one specific example, which I'm struggling with. So if UV light is useful because it creates vitamin D and the vitamin D makes actually immune system stimulate that, and uh, that's the way to go. And then it, it makes less sense to put UV light in AC units uh, in air conditioning units. Uh, then it's more useful, you know, that people get exposed to UV light. Uh, do you have a take on this? Is there any uh, indication which one works better? So should we still have UV light in the no, air conditioning? So or? It's very important to understand some of the most effective UV light. Uh, I think it's the UVC. There's a UVA, UVB, UVC. Mm -hmm. They are different wavelengths. So the most effective UV light is dangerous to humans. And, and, uh, and you know, just like you are going to these tanning salons and so on, we know that it's not a good idea to be there for too long. So, so having them, you know, hidden somewhere, for instance, in air conditioning systems and filters is a good idea because there you can use very efficient UV light, I assume. I'm speculating. But the airplanes even ha are thinking now that they should start putting into the, their air conditioning systems uh, UV light. Uh, the, so in that sense, you know, that's where you can use the strongest UV if you are going to, you know, do. And the same applies to buses and so on. And, if you are going to try to stimulate humans, uh, you know, then then you can do then then you can go and, and do lower level lower level UV lights. I think people are Finland has a bar, for instance, or is it two, two bars now that are keep open and they have UV lights by which they disinfect the, the place. So they they claim that they do it. But how does it work? How long does it take? Can I just you know go through? some doors and then being disinfected or I have to be exposed for X number of minutes or hours? Oh, it's very, it's very fast. The buses, I think, are disinfected in 15 minutes. 
and 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 the UV light. The, there was just a recent big study of how far, how well the UV light kills the virus in in the in the open air, you know, outside or, or on certain surfaces. And it, it's, uh, the virus is very vulnerable to UV light. And that is true. So there was one question by Denise, that's true for any virus, not just for the particular COVID-19 virus. Yes. Because you had these seasonal patterns across many viruses, coronaviruses early on yes. in the first slide. Yes. Actually, most of these most of these studies, when I say it kills the virus, it kills the corona some coronavirus rather than you know COVID. But they have some COVID studies, I think, recently done. But but it's the coronavirus. So what's uh, the next task for you, and what's your prediction in the long run? So you have quite a dark prediction for the next few months. But do you have a positive? We always would like to end the the meeting with a positive note. And, uh, what would you do if you, I mean, you're in this commission, you probably give recommendations to the Finnish government. Uh, do you have any recommendations to yes, economists please. and to, to the audience here? And if, you know, as a policymaker, more generally for the world, in, and all, including emerging economies? Well, I, I haven't studied that much, but the emerging economies obviously are very vulnerable in terms of finance. But as, as I said, you know, they may be more protected uh, in terms of the virus itself. Though one has to, of course, have, they, they live in different conditions and they socialize in very different ways and so on. So I think the, that's still a very open question. The virus itself is, of course, very localized. So, you know, very heterogeneous. It, it comes in bursts. It sort of, it's, it's its behavioral pattern is very different from the traditional coronaviruses. So that should be noted. And also you don't have symptoms. So, so you know, be, you are very infective. You can infect people before symptoms. So it's not like just like the other coronavirus. So it's very hard to predict, but recommendations for Finland, I would be very cautious. You know, I, I would put, I would be proactive right now. And, and, and that's very difficult for the people. Let me say that one of the positive things about learning, what do I do with knowing? So, you know, you can ask, so what, you know, so it's seasonal. It's very big deal because you can prepare for it, like I'm suggesting now, but also mentally, it is like a seasonal thing and people will mentally feel very different if they know, for instance, that this is actually be, is going to be gone by say March or April. I would say I would have voted. It's gone by May, you know, on the poll, mm. and 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 uh, I definitely don't think. I think yeah, it would be astonishing if it went over the summer, unless you know things are the policies here in the U.S. are completely screwed up. But in these other countries, I don't. I don't think that's going to happen. And so, so I would say pre precautionary measures and and. Uh, there's all sorts of others, you know, about being very targeted and so on, because it, it has this very heterogeneous uh, pattern. You know, it, it flares up. And you look at the Chinese. I mean, that's, that's where I would look. They have controlled these things. China, Taiwan, you know, the Asians have handled this virus incredibly well. But can I ask you uh, one more? So we spend millions or, you know, a lot of money to get better tests and also to develop uh, uh, vaccinations. And we spend hardly any amount of money on, on UV lights. Do you think there was a misallocation of resources? We should spend way more energy and money on developing UV protect or UV lights in various places where we move around. So every supermarket should, when you walk in, you should walk through a UV light first. Uh, yeah, you, you might have watched uh, one of the Formula One circus events had the, had the drivers walk through a, 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 a you know, a humid, a hum, yeah. humid a fog and, and, and UV light. I don't know what kind of stunt that was because I don't think that was enough to kill the virus. But, but yes, I, I think UV lights is on the table. I mean, Finland, there's people who are researching this and trying to find what the Certainly, if it stays around this virus, 
you know, if it becomes seasonal, like the 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 coronavirus, the other coronaviruses, and 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 we don't develop good vaccines or something, and even the vaccines are going to come slowly into the picture because of the fear and so on, vaccine fear and other things. So on. I I think it's uh, yes, it's one of the tools that that I would look into, and and, and uh, I mean, you know, we'll we'll know more by the you know three months from now or four months we will know more whether whether this seasonality is as described as we think it is so if uh, so let's uh, have a final question uh, if i'm a, a gifted econometrician and i would like to work on this data uh, what would you recommend somebody uh, you know who works with time series data in general do you have any particular recommendation that we should really help the world by working on this data or the economists or econometricians can bring a lot to bear on this question. And this data, will you make this data available at some point to anybody once it's published? I think I should say that there's a long appendix, you know, to this talk, which uh, we are happy to leave on for you to distribute when you distribute mm -hmm. something. We, we, you know, it's like the whole thing is 80 pages or something and it has a lot of references. So anybody interested in working on this, should should you know take a look at that uh, selection of, of of its commentaries on our runs there's econometric runs and so on so so we would uh, i would say that uh, that looking into peru and other countries looking into this altitude question i think would be interesting to, to either dismiss it or, or or get reinforcement there are, so there are concrete questions uh, i would say that uh, looking into this this endogeneity issue is really a big issue, and so, so, so you know, I, I think I think if you if if people can find some other instrumental ins, you know instrumental instrumental variable, uh, I have to ask my colleagues, but because they that's there's a whole bunch of people that are experts on finding instrumental variables that clever clever ideas. So we we haven't really spent that much time on it. So I would, I would, that would fit sort of the pattern of where econometrics, econometrics is today, or at least part of econometrics is today. So I would like to ask your co-authors too, if they want to jump in in any way, you can also jump in now before we conclude. Right, thank you. I'm just on the data. Uh, there's a link in the presentation to the mm -hmm. data sources. So. Um, we, as Ben said, we very much welcome any any further work on this, and uh, and, and we feel that it would be very important that uh, other people would 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 also work on this uh, issue. Great. So I hope that uh, there will be a whole cohort of econometricians working on that, and other statisticians and economists uh, to really tease out. Uh, and if this, you know, turns out to be the case, I think it's a huge contribution to human mankind to get the, you know, how to fight the COVID. And I think uh, this way we can manage it much quicker, hopefully, and, and get it behind us. Thanks again to all three of you, I think for fantastic work and for putting this together and stimulating talk for, to Banked uh, and also for the work. So it was a fantastic talk and I think uh, it, Make, uh, might make a big difference the way we will uh, manage the COVID crisis. Thanks again and hope to see you soon again and uh, keep chatting. Thank you very thanks. much, uh, Marcus, for putting this on and thanks for people to coming in and listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.